This is just designed to be an overview of rounds and globes and chains. It's not, I'm not gonna get into the, all the, the hardcore complicated math and all that nonsense associated with yugas and things like that. It's, it's heavily veiled and designed to be difficult. Um, and it's, in the final analysis, it's not really important. We'll see a few numbers just to give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about and, and how radically different it is from Western science thinks and knows about it. And in that sense, it's valuable to see some of the, the numbers. But what's really important is to just have um, a mental conception of the big picture and then to use that when you're studying the things that DK says about it. A lot of this material is, is drawn from um, bits and pieces of the secret doctrine, uh, some from what of DK from Cosmic Fire, and mostly in terms of just the overview from the book, um, The Solar System by A.E. Powell, which if you can find it, <laughs> um, I, I highly recommend you get it. With the caveat that there are errors in it that DK pointed out in various places. And well, actually HPB tried to point it out, particularly with the names of schemes. Well, and I'll cover it when we get to it. And some of the names of globes, which DK says really the, the, the system of naming globes and schemes by, as a, um, using planet names is confusing and should, and should stop, even though he gives them na planetary names. Um, and the numbers would be better, although he says using a numbering system shouldn't imply sequence in time, which is really confusing. <laughs> it's, it's, scheme one comes first, supposedly, in whatever that means. And who's so, the author, Cliff? Um, who's the author? Oh, so I don't, I don't know if you, you can see it, but it's, it's the solar system by A.E. Powell. Lieutenant Colonel Powell. Okay, Powell. thank you. Also helpful is, well, I show you the picture of it. This one, Galaxy Solar Systems to Genesis, that's useful for mm -hmm. sorting some of the some of the stuff out, but it's it's got some useful points. So the first thing you have to realize are these aphorisms, which essentially are saying that space is an entity. And it's the one in which we live and move and have our being. And that in, you'll begin to understand that, that that is literally true. Space is an entity. The suns are like atoms of matter or chakras in these great beings. And the planets are like chakras. Um, we, tend to, we tend to materialize them in our minds in our three-dimensional time, space, physical kind of a conception. But... You'll see in a minute that a planet is really a scheme and a scheme is a system of essentially many spheres, just in the same way that you, you're, you're, you consist of many bodies, the least important of which, esoterically speaking, is your physical body. Far more important are the subtle bodies, the etheric, the astral, the mental, the causal and, and beyond. The, those, those things are real and they're far more important in terms of causality and the scheme of things um, than are your physical body and effects that happen in the, in the subtle bodies impact the physical. It's just that our consciousness, which is tied to the, the, the physical and, and identified with the physical tends to fixate on that. So this is, anyway, this is important to keep in mind. So we want to start at the beginning, which is how a solar system forms. And we're going to start, we're going to go from the, from the big out in. Basically, there's this divine circulation of energy that goes, it, it, that goes between all these suns and the planets. And interestingly, from the perspective of this solar system, this solar system is said to be the heart center in the one about whom naught may be said, which in a certain sense means that this center is somehow responsible for the circulation of the life blood, 
whatever the esoteric correspondence of that is throughout the, the body of the one about whom naught may be said. And that the circulation involves basically the movement of monads. Some are David and some are human monads. Well, I say human as in the category of lives that incar incarnate on the human line, which basically the lives that have to do with like the elemental, the, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the, the human kingdom, and then the superhuman kingdoms. All of those kingdoms at one point or another pass through the human condition. They either will in the future or have in the past, the ones that are past us, beyond us, above us. And that's in that's a distinct and separate from Deva monads. The Devas are responsible for the building of forms. All the monads on the human type line, and which eventually go on to be planet, the human line are the types that go on to be Manus and root Manus. And the, the Lord of the world is simply a Manu. He's just a Manu of a chain or a scheme or a, a you know, there or a, a solar. Those are all categories of quote unquote Manus. Um, so beings on the monads on the, the human line, they start in the mineral kingdom and they evolve eventually beyond the, the human kingdom into the divine kingdoms up become solar logos becomes um, a planet, a planetary logos, a solar logos and whatever's beyond that, which are these cosmic things. And that, so this solar system is actually, and we know this from what DK says, connected to lots of other stars and constellations in our vicinity. And that, that, that in the final analysis and the circulation of energy between those things in the form of groups of lives moving, which to some extent, and this is what all the creative hierarchies have to do with creative hierarchies, which, which have been assigned zodiacal names sort of suggests that those hierarchies have their origin in those constellations. And the, 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 the flow of life energy via the movement of the monadic lives into the kingdom, kingdom into this system and other systems and other planets are, are sort of the basis for some of the, this energy as, as it circulates in what we call astrology. The death of the solar system is when, and this system is, is said by DK to be the second of three incarnations that this solar logos will have. And apparently all solar logos at the level of our solar logos have three incarnations. And that this is the, the second, and that this is a, a picture of an exploded star. Now, what's interesting about it is the ring nebula all around it. And, they, and astronomers know that we have something like this around the outside of ours. So it's not clear if this, this solar system is the remnant of a previous one or exactly how it works. But the next, the next statement by HPP suggests that the, the, the substance here is a combination of new substance that was brought in and old substance. And, and how that works is a little bit bizarre. This is an actual quote from the secret doctrine talking about how a solar system and the planets form. The, uh, the assertion that all worlds, stars, planets, etc., as soon as the nucleus of primordial substance in the Laya undifferentiated state is informed by the freed principles of a just deceased sidereal body, becomes first comets and then suns to cool down to inhabitable worlds is a teaching as old as the Rishis. So that's basically saying that our solar logos, quote unquote, died at the end of his hundred years of Brahma, which is basically 311 trillion years. That's the number that, that's given for a hundred years of Brahma. Apparently there's another 311 that take place in the Pralaya between the hundred years of Brahma. There's a there's a, all of these cycles, there's a, like a day and a night, whether it's really that number of years or, or it's symbolic is not exactly clear, but there was enough places in the book where they suggest that they, these numbers, the ones that have been given out are, are pretty close to real. They may not be exact because the, there, there's a lot of esoteric secrets in, 
in, in the exactitude in part because they don't want people of, or beings with incorrect motives to be able to use that to predict certain things. Because um, if you understand these cycles, apparently, you, you can actually get down to predicting specific things for yourself and, and sub races and root races and nations and things like that. It goes on to say that this, the, thus the secret books as we see distinctly teach an astronomy that would not be rejected even by modern speculation, could the latter thoroughly understand its teachings. A lie center is lighted and awakened into life by the fires of another pilgrim, after which the new center rushes into space and becomes a comet. It is only after losing its velocity and hence its fiery tail that the fiery dragon settles down into a quiet and steady life as a regular and respectable citizen of the sidereal family. Therefore, it is said, born in the unfathomable depths of space. And this is from one of the, this is actually from the book of Zion, out of a homo, homogeneous element called the world soul. Every nucleus of cosmic matter suddenly launched into being begins life under the most hostile circumstances. Through a series of countless ages, it has to conquer for itself a place in the infinitudes. It circles round and round between denser and already fixed bodies moving by jerks and pulling towards some given point or center that attracts it and like as a ship down into a channel dotted with reefs and sunken rocks, trying to avoid other bodies that draw and repel it in turn. Many perish, their mass disintegrating through stronger masses and when born within a system, chiefly within the insatiable stomachs of various suns. Those which move slower and are propelled into an elliptic course are doomed to an annihilation sooner or later. Others moving in parabolic curves generally escape destruction owing to their velocity. There's some other stuff I read that, that basically says if it's a cosmic logos, if it's a solar logos, after uh, it dies in, in let's say one of its incarnations, it goes it, it, and it's ready to be reborn. It finds a cloud of matter somewhere in this in the region where it was and it focuses its intention and the substance begins to coalesce into something like a interstellar comet and that comet then sort of wanders around in space finding its way back to the approximate location of where it had been before somehow and um proceeds to to, um, to become an, a nebula that eventually out of which the star is born. So, and it, it returns to this, the region of space where it had been in the previous incarnation because it has a place to play, a role to play in a larger entity like our solar and Lilgus in the one about whom not may be said. And in relation to all the other stars that it is somehow and constellations, which are collections of stars that are related like some kind of a egoic group, constellations are regarded in a certain sense as an egoic group. Um, all those solo logi are connected in some way on some cosmic level. And so the, the solo logos has to find its way back to roughly where it had been in space before because it's related to all of those stars and it has a role to play. And eventually it settles down somewhere and the nebula begins to begins to contract and the star sort of starts to get born and it over billions and trillions of years it 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 essentially organizes the substance into uh into into like a disk and there are even images of that and i found some which seem to support this statement and they, these are stars solar nebula that appear to be birthing the birth of some kind of a solar system and you'll see that the, the, the this bit on the right is showing the, a dark cloud against the, the background of stars this is just basically one of these comets that sort of ended up where it is and it's in space where it's going to birth its birth itself into a star and form a solar system and begins to form like organizes a nebula and then slowly over time it somehow organizes this substance into rings, not unlike the rings of Saturn, 
that that are different densities and grades of matter it has something to do with harmonics as as actually even our own astronomers and plato discovered is that the platonic solids and the dimensions of those platonic solids do apply to the to the orbits of and of the planets relative to the distance from the sun so there's there's some kind of harmonic mathematical musical kind of a thing and it and it organizes the substance into things that eventually coalesce into planets. Another way that, that HPB says planets form is when a planetary logos, like the Earth logos from of the Earth scheme, when, when one of the chains ends, basically, and it's ready to reincarnate again after its pralaya, it basically goes out into that cosmic ring at the edge of the solar system, gets um, stuck, somehow manages to, to coalesce matter into a comet. And then the comet finds its you know, way back into the solar system and it returns basically to the place where it was. So our planetary logos returned literally to where it had been before, which is why we're next to the moon. I just put these three books here because these are the primarily the secret doctrine and solar system that I, I pulled all this from as an overview. And, and so this, this just giving you some, some pictures, some of which we've seen, some of which we haven't. This is the sun and its relationship to all the constellations. Just realizing that the sun is a center in this thing called the one about whom not may be said, which is, which is greater than the seven solar systems and, um, and, and that of which the seven centers in this one about whom not may be said, along with all these other constellations, which are somehow part of this much larger entity. So this is DK's picture from Cosmic Fire that the VGM is colorized, right? These are our familiar things showing um, our uh, planetary logos here and showing that there are uh, planetary logi actually on our monadic plane of our cosmic physical plane. The planetary logi have a, a monadic unit here. They're part of connected to the causal body of the solar logos and who's in one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> there's ease this thing just shows you this massive hierarchy of of beings it's never ending and that's the sort of one of the main reasons for understanding this is to just realize that someday we'll be if you're on the human line you're going to end up <clears throat> in as a planetary logos and then as, as a manu and then as a planetary logos and then as a cosmic logos and it goes on and on these little tables here show you some of the just to give you a sense of it, that, that come from cosmic fire and other things, that the head center of the one about whom, these are all relative centers in the one about whom not may be said. It's the great bear is the head, Ajna is, the, Sirius is the Ajna center, Pleiades is the throat center, our sun is supposedly the heart center, Orion is said to be the solar plexus, and Taurus is said to be the sacral center, and Draco the base center. Um, some of the other things that are influencing that aren't mentioned here are Little Bear, that's a Little Dipper, um, our Pole Star, and the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. So all of those are elements in the one about whom not may be said. <clears throat> DK gives this chart over here on the right um, <clears throat> in Cosmic Fire. Basically just lists that the entity, the one about whom not may be said, his vehicle are the seven constellations. And he's, he's a center and a cosmic logos. And the space that he occupies are five cosmic planes, his, his being, his consciousness, right? Because don't forget, a plane is essentially an expression of consciousness, a, a condition of consciousness. So his, his space, his consciousness, is occupies five cosmic planes. <clears throat> then a cosmic logos is seven solar systems. One of those, a center in his being is a solar logos. 
and, this, and it occupies four cosmic planes. A solar logos is seven planetary schemes. He's, the center is quote unquote, a center in his body is a heavenly man or basically a planet, a planetary scheme. And the consciousness of a solar logos takes up three cosmic planes. You can see this cosmic mental, astral, and then our cosmic physical. And then he goes on to say, then he talks about a period of time. I guess they don't really know what the periods of time are for these. But the period of time that a solar logos occupies is the period of time that takes up three solar systems. We don't really know what that is, although if it's like all the other things, then it's 300, it's 622 trillion years for each solar system. So that's a really long time and science isn't even close to know, to understanding this. A heavenly man or a planetary scheme, right? Has, his vehicle consists of seven planetary chains. So this, which when we're talking about a heavenly man, we're talking about earth or Saturn or Venus. A center in his body is a Chohan or Chohans in groups, egoic groups. And his consciousness occupies two cosmic planes, you know, only going up onto the cosmic astral. And the period, the period of time that his consciousness and his existence involves is the period of one solar system. And the analogy down here at the bottom is the analogy as above, so below. A man, seven etheric centers, a principle in his body is like a monadic principle or the Buddhic principle. And he occupies one cosmic plane and one planetary scheme. Why one planetary scheme? Because if you're evolving according to the time frame and you stay on track, then you then you would enter a scheme in the first chain as a mineral. And in the second chain, you would be a vegetable. And in the third chain, you would be a hum, uh, an animal. And in the fourth chain, the one we're in, the earth chain, you would, become, you would be human. And then in five, six, and seven, you would evolve beyond to, to other things. <clears throat> now, not everyone progresses at the same space. And, and people who don't make the grade get taken out of this scheme and sent somewhere else. Um, and people who I guess were slow in some other scheme they, they can come into this scheme um, and at, some, at whatever point they got taken out of the other one, when the scheme, when there's a chain in the scheme that is suitable for them to continue. So now we come down to the chart from Cosmic Fire that DK gives for our solar system. And it's, it's basically sh showing that um, the sun as a, symbol or triangle, right? The, the cosmic logos, this is causal body, I guess. And then these two Uranus and Neptune schemes of which the planets are the dense, a dense physical globe associated with it somewhere in its evolution. Although he doesn't say exactly what they are, where they are in that, as are all the planets showing the, these, these schemes and the relationship. Now, the thing that's, well, the Logos, he builds it all from start to end in his mind, right? So it's, it's his plan. He sets the plan before it all gets set into motion. And then eventually it starts to manifest and, and, and over time evolve into the image in his mind. And there are these things called outpourings, right? And so, and they may be related to the solar systems, although it's not entirely clear. Um, because the first one sounds a little bit like, like what we, we hear about the first solar system that attained to intelligence, or it may be a recapitulation of all three phases in this one, but that was not clear to me. It, but he says that the first outpouring is from his third aspect, right? His intelligence aspect. And that gives the protoplasmic matter of the new vehicle the power to combine into chemical elements. And in the Bible, that, that stage is, 
is symbolized by the phrase, the spirit of the God, God moves upon the face of the waters. Waters being the symbol in a lot of these older texts for matter. This is what we're told about the first solar system. And, and I repeat, I don't know for sure if this is referring to the first solar system or is this just referring to the first stage of the birth of this one? Um, probably both actually. This, this is sort of the, the outpouring that the, the innate, that essentially gives the protoplasmic substance out of the cosmic, you know, the, the cosmic um, comet matter that he's brought to the region in space where he's incarnating basically gives it the intelligence to combine into atoms. So, so there's that phase, right? And then it obviously takes ages. And I've always thought that was an interesting aspect of things is that, right, the fact that matter knows how to follow the laws and combine into atoms of hydrogen and carbon and et cetera, not random or willy nilly. The fact that it, it follows quote unquote law and has some in, innate intelligence that enables it to do that is all tied up with, with the imbuing of substance with the intelligence aspect. And then the second outpouring forms group souls basically are the basis of the various kingdoms, minerals, plants, animals, right? Every, every kingdom has a group life behind it. And then supposedly the third outpouring from the first aspect, the life aspect, is what brings the, the human ego into, or the human monad, the monads, into the life units, into the system. Another thing to, 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 be, to keep an eye on are these. So he tells us where some of the planets in this system are in their, their system of rounds and globes and chains. So he's telling us that the Earth's scheme is in its fourth chain, fourth globe. And you'll understand what that means in a minute, if you don't already. Jupiter is in its third chain, fourth globe. Saturn is in its third chain, fourth globe. Mars is in its fourth chain, fourth globe, sort of like us, although not, uh, not exactly at the same stage. Vulcan is in the third chain, fourth globe. Venus is ahead of us, fifth chain, fifth globe. And Mercury is fourth chain, fifth globe. Mercury is apparently where we should be. The Earth is behind um, yeah, because of the failure on the moon chain. If that hadn't happened, we'd be in our fourth chain, fifth globe. You'll understand what, exactly what this means in a second. I'll uh, focus on that. Now, when something is in its, the inter, like look at something like, um, like Saturn, third chain, fourth globe, right? It's a gas, it's a gas ball. It, as one comes down through the chains, it gets denser. Doesn't mean there's no physical matter there. Obviously something's starting to coalesce, but as far as we know, it's all just gas and clouds. Um, and that's perhaps symptomatic of, but in its fourth globe. So one sees the dense body of a planet starting to form there, but it's still in its third chain, which, which when we get to the next couple of slides that show how these things descend down onto the planes and, and how in the early stages, they don't have a dense physical body, they have subtler bodies. You'll perhaps understand why those things are just gas balls or something like Venus and Mercury, which are, which are in more evolved than the earth. Their life has now moved off the dense physical and is in the subtle realms. And so those things don't appear to, to us to have any life on the physical plane, although they do, they, they have, they have very evolved life on the planet. It's just on the, the subtler globes. And again, the thing to keep in mind is it's, it's like an individual having different bodies, a causal body, a mental body, an astral body, a physical and etheric body. And so as you work your way down, so when you incarnate, you start with, in the, you're in the subtle realms and then you put down a nucleus and eventually that nucleus coalesces into a form. But 
or when you die, you drop the physical, but you still have an etheric until that dissipates. And then you still have an astral and a mental, and depending on where you are and what you eat that those things may or may not dissipate, but <clears throat> there's still the subtle bodies. And when you reincarnate, those things come back into, uh, into, um, into effect. It's the same way with the planet. The planet has a, a planetary scheme has only one chain that's an incarnation at any one time, apparently. But, um, and it, it's, it's life, it's, is working down through the planes, but there's activity in all the, in all the, in all the globes, all of its vehicles. It's just a question of where it's, where it's focused. So this chart down here was suggested um, as a way of thinking about, about these things where even though it appears from the concrete physical plane to our eyes, like there isn't a connection between the sun and the physical planets, there actually is. On the subtle realms, every, everything is, is connected energetically and via subtle, subtle lines of energy. Um, and, and these were just two ways of showing it. And, and it said that this was sort of, it, it used this diagram to say, this is kind of like where if the planets were the tips of a fingers on a hand and the hand was the sun and these are the fingers. So they're all connected. It's just that all we see are the tips poking through the water. Like the tips of a, of a hand beneath the surface of the water and all you see underneath is just the tips. So we, you, you, can't, you shouldn't think of them as separate. They're not, they're all interrelated. They're all part of, you know, the one within, within we live and move and have our being, which is the solar system. And that's obviously true because even on, even, you know, physical science knows that if the sun went out, all life would die in a matter of days. So it is the source of energy that keeps all life in this system, particularly on our planet, for sure, alive. So each one of these quote unquote symbols represents a scheme each one of these circles in the scheme represents a chain. It seems like the chains go in sequence. The first one, it work, the consciousness of the being works first through the first chain, then, then that goes into pralaya, then it goes to the second chain, then that goes into pralaya, then it goes to the third chain, and that goes into pralaya. These are the major centers in its body, but apparently there are other schemes that um, are not as major and not as important that are in the system and there it's not said what they are although in, in esoteric astrology dk says there's over 150 bodies seen and unseen in our soul system so they're all they're all related to some logos that's in training or or doing something more exalted within the the system that we, <clears throat> we don't understand what would i find interesting is venus is a Vulcan is in the third chain, fourth globe. So quote unquote, it's dense physical, but on the, in the third chain, the fourth globe only goes down as far as the etheric plane, what we call the etheric plane. So that may be why we can't see it. It's regarded as physical because it's on the physical etheric plane on the etheric piece, but not on the physical plane. So perhaps if we looked in the right direction with the right equipment, we would see its heat signature. So, now we're, we're talking about the earth scheme. So this is showing each of the chains, right? Every, this is the earth scheme over here. And see it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chains. And then those little circles in there are globes. These energetic configurations, it's not exactly clear what those mean. That's very esoteric. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. The way the, the, way the life waves move is they, they move the, the, the logos of the scheme works first through the first chain, then it goes into pralaya, then it goes through the second chain, then it goes into pralaya, then it goes through the third chain, then it goes into pralaya, vice versa, until we get to where we are right now. So here's the earth chain, which is the fourth chain of the earth scheme. And we're in, the, and then that the, when the, the life wave goes around these, these circles, there's seven of them in a chain are called globes. So basically the, all the lives that are working through 
the scheme. They first, they go into a chain and they go around. And then when it's all done, they go into Pralaya and then they go into the next chain and they go around. And when it's all done, they go into Pralaya and then they go into the next chain and so forth. And so a couple of things you'll notice about this is D, these are DK's names for them from Cosmic Fire. The DK's names for the chains. Now he, again, he says, these names are confusing and we should drop the habit of giving them planetary names, but he did give them. So I, I gave them. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that the moon chain is called Saturn. And the, the which, which in, in the Powell books and in, um, in the theosophical literature, they get wrong. And the Mercury chain is called Mercury in all the books, but they also get that wrong. <clears throat> um, so you have to take all that stuff with a grain of salt. It is worth, it is worth reading the solar, fire, the, the solar System book by A.E. Powell and taking the big picture, but there's a lot of detail in there particularly gets in all the goings on of who came from what chain and what they were doing in the world. This now. That's what DK was alluding to when, when he was saying that they, that they just, you know, reached the height of glamor when they started tracing their little, little group of TS people through all the rounds and globes and chains back into the, into the, into the moon chain. And it, like, they're in the center of everything all, all along and right in there, you know, all that stuff you can just, ignore <clears throat> it's the big picture in this book so you'll notice here the moon chain this was the previous chain to the one we're in now the moon our moon is the dead remnant of that chain so apparently what's what happened is supposedly that got a, that that chain got aborted early evil was egos were, were individualizing on that chain not through the process of initiation, not the way we do it here. And some of them were going, becoming quite egocentric and selfish and evil. And um, I think he says that the solar logo stepped in and terminated it, prevented it from going. One thing you'll find here is there's no PC in this. I mean, one thing that you find when you read this book is vast numbers of races and lives of kingdoms just get annihilated and wiped out <laughs> good <laughs> all con continuously it's just uh, time to form a new branch race um we'll have a cataclysm and clear all those old bodies out and we'll we'll send a few of the good ones over to this part of the world um and have them intermarry over there and start forming a new thing meanwhile over here we'll have a cataclysm or a pole shift or whatever and just you know it's kind of like it's kind of like me as a kid doing this on the anthill <laughs> my chick training is a future manu anyway it was aborted early this chain that's why this chain is behind which should be in our this is the earth chain where we are now it's the densest we should be we should be on the Mercury globe, but we're, we're on the, the Earth globe. And so, so what apparently happened is, so that gets terminated or the, the, the solar logos orders the, the planetary logos to, 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 uh, to terminate. And so he does, goes into Pralaya, and which means the moon is way, way older than the Earth, right? The, the Earth is, is approximately two billion years old but there was a prolia between between this incarnation the earth chain, chain and the earth and the moon chain's termination of it's not clear it's never said although if it's the same as the day and night of the earth chain then it would there would have been another four billion years between that and then the moon chain for however long it was going on was before it got aborted three or four billion years so it's 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 easily eight nine ten billion years older than the earth and so what seems to have happened is the logos goes into pralaya gets ready to incarnate again in the earth chain becomes a comet finds his way back to where he was before 
um, parks next to the moon. Um, and then essentially all the lunar substance and this starts to put the lie to some of these, this, you know, it's some of the weird stuff that people get into with the moon's hollow and this and that. Basically what the esoteric doctrine says is what we see of the moon is, 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 is more of its core and less of its, it was much larger in the past. A lot of its substance has been sucked off onto the planet, basically been basically sucked over to this, this planet to become part of this planet. It's, it's dissipating. It was very fiery and molten and all kinds of weird stuff. So exactly how it happens not is it's clear, but it, according to the esoteric doctrine, basically the planetary logos becomes a comet, parks next to the, fly, you know, flies around for a while, parks next to the moon, and then um, the life waves start transferring over here, right? Because let's say, which, so theoretically, if we were all on track timing wise, we started out in the mineral kingdom on the Neptune chain. And then we, we evolved to the uh, vegetable kingdom in the Venus chain, the animal kingdom on the moon chain and the human kingdom on the earth chain. Now, if, if you were a slow poke, then you might've come in here from some other scheme. And there are life waves going into and out of chains on every round. And you'll, you'll see what that means in a minute, but it may have something to do with the significance of the number 13. Because there are 13 life waves that enter a chain and they come from elsewhere to constantly revivifying. So when, uh, let's say at the end of this kingdom, at the end of this chain, the Neptune chain, the highest of the seven kingdoms that was evolving through it is now ready to evolve off. So at the end of this chain, they leave, but there needs to be seven kingdoms. So another one, another one comes in from elsewhere to be the, to be the mineral kingdom on the Venus chain. So on the Venus chain, it forms the mineral kingdom. But now on the Venus chain, the seventh kingdom, the highest, when it's done with the chain after the seven rounds of this chain, it leaves, goes somewhere else, and another chain has to come in. So you'll see that there's seven, seven kingdoms plus, and then seven leave, six leave, and six come in throughout the course of these seven things. So there's 13 groups of lives that enter the scheme during its entire course of evolution. So the other thing is that this, this diagram here on the right is attempting to show each of the globes in the, in the chain. So this is the first chain, the Neptune chain, right? This is the second one, the Venus one. This is the third, the moon, the earth, and we, these other ones, the Mercury, which we're, we haven't been, we're not there yet, Mars, Jupiter, these the names that were given to these chains. Um, you'll see that basically they descend in their subtle matter, which was why if, if a, if a, if the scheme is in its first chain, we're not going to see it. It's subtle. When DK says there's 150 schemes in our system that we don't see, or planetary logi of some on one stage or another that we don't see, they're, they're in these stages of their scheme, the chains one or two, or one, some of these others where they're, if they had a physical body, because they're in the end of it, the end of their scheme, that's long since dissipated or they're in the beginning and the, the physical body hasn't coalesced yet. It's not, the substance isn't on the lo low enough planes for, for it to be seen with physical sight and physical senses. The other thing is, is to understand these bodies, they're, they're not really strung out like beads on a, on a necklace. They're really more like spheres, concentric spheres around a central fit, right? With the, the dense physical body, if it has it, or the, the lowest densest thing in the center with the subtle bodies being higher. Anyway, this is just shows that with each chain, the globes of the, of the chain get lower and lower down the dense to the point where we get to the physical, to the earth chain, and it has a physical body on the physical plane that we can see. So this is one of the few places where you're gonna get any numbers. It says that the duration of the chain is 4.3 billion years. So the, so the entire duration, of the earth chain 
and that we're not there yet. We're only about halfway through, which is why it's said to be in around 1.9 billion. Um, well, well, I'll give you some of the numbers on that. The, then the pralaya between the previous chain and the next chain is also 4.3 billion. So the time that, that by the, if it's true that we're roughly 2 billion years into the earth chain, we won't be on the mercury chain for another 6 billion years. Mm -hmm. another, another 2 billion to complete the chain, another 4 billion to pralaya, and then the mercury, the mercury chain will start. So again, this is just reiterating. One scheme has seven chains. So this is the Earth scheme. Each, each chain has a monvatar and a pralaya. One chain has seven globe periods. These are the seven globe periods of the Earth chain. Each of those has a monvatar and a pralaya. There's a period of, of activity on the globe and then a pralaya, and then it moves to the next globe, and then a pralaya, and then it moves to the next globe. A chain has seven rounds or light of the life wave. So all the seven kingdoms will go all, all around and you'll see that in a minute. So then they get into this type of stuff that one round has seven globes. These are the seven globes. One chain has seven rounds. It goes, the life wave goes around these seven globes seven times. So they, they spend, they're, they're, they have 49 what's called globe periods. The life wave goes to each globe, goes around it seven times and seven times seven is 49. The one scheme has seven chains with 49 rounds with 343 globe periods. <clears throat> and these kinds of numbers repeat. And these are the basis of the astronomical and the astrological cycles that the Hindus are spending forever calculating in their calendars. So this is the, again, this is just a up close of the earth scheme from cosmic fire with this other table that was on the other thing, just showing you what the where the other things are earth is in its fourth chain fourth globe so see fourth chain fourth globe this is where we are jupiter is in its third chain fourth globe so jupiter is in this in something analogous to our moon chain also on its fourth globe but its fourth globe you'll see is only on the etheric ditto for for vulcan there's a lot of things in the third chain fourth globe that we see, which I guess makes sense, right? That, that the things that we see and know for the most part, with the exception of Vulcan, which we don't see yet, either because it's so close to the sun that we, we can't see it um, because it's, it's said to be inside the orbit of Mercury. Um, but it, it also appears, seems to be in etheric matter. So this is just my little picture. That was home before. That was our, that was our previous planetary home. Yeah, and this is said to be a lot smaller than it used to be. A lot of the substance that was there is here now. And this is supposedly more of the core, what's left of the core of the planet. So now we get specifically to the Earth chain. This is Earth. This is where um, the TS goes off. HPB emphatically led better and descent decided that we were, that this, 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 the globe previous to the one that we're on, our dense physical globe now, they called it Mars. They said it was actually the, the planet Mars that we see out there in space. HBB said, no, it's not. That's, it's just a symbolic name for an inner globe of this planet. The planet Mars that we see flying around the sun, that's its own scheme. That's its own logos. It's not the same thing. But they decided HPB didn't know what she was talking about. Well, DK said it straight when he gave us this chart of the schemes. And there it is. You see in the Earth scheme, there is a, a thing called Mars, but the third chain in, in um, the TS, they refer to it as, as Mars, DK calls it Saturn. They recall the fifth chain as Mercury. DK also calls it Mercury. But again, both he and HPB, and I'm gonna take their words for it, over Ledbetter and Descent, say that it's not obviously the same thing as the scheme. So therefore it's not Mars, which is, the fourth globe in the fourth chain of the Mars scheme or Mercury, which is the fourth globe of the fourth chain, fifth globe in that scheme. So those are two different logi. They're not the same thing. These are symbolic names. So he's right. We shouldn't use planetary names. It's really confusing. I haven't been able to figure out what exactly these names mean. Although it does appear that 
our, our fifth chain is called Mercury, which is perhaps because the, uh, the Mercury is in its fifth globe, fourth chain. I'm not sure why he names those. It's not clear to me. But anyway, just, just be clear about that. Um, the, the planet Mars that we call Mars in, in astrology and astronomy is its own scheme. And it's not what's being referred to when we're talking about the previous globe of the Earth chain, right? So here we are in the Earth chain, the, the, fourth, the fourth chain of the Earth scheme. And here we are on planet Earth right now, today, on the fourth globe, which is physical. This is just showing you once again that when a scheme gets to its fourth chain, the fourth globe is down here on the dense physical, okay? So that's why we see dense physical. And that the way to think about these globes, all of them, basically like bodies with the dense physical in the middle and then the etheric and the astral and, and so forth. And so this is not traveling through different planets. It's, it's basically really more like a going down and up. So the, the, the focus of the logos is in one or another of his body. So he basically, as he goes and quote round, it calls the rounds, these seven rounds, these life waves. Basically, it's like the logos focusing, coming down into incarnation, going down through the bodies, carrying out activities in each of these vehicles, and then going back up in some kind of cycle seven waves. So now we're talking about purely the earth chain. And when the life wave goes around the chain, that's called a round. And a chain has seven rounds before it ends. We're in the fourth round. So we're in the fourth round of the fourth chain on the fourth globe. All I am able to ascertain in terms of that fairly confidently because Peruka says it, said that H seems to have said that HPB was right. And if you read HPB very carefully, um, she says it. And he sort of untangles it a little bit, but it takes 308 million years for the, in this fourth chain is the only thing I'm clear on. Although some math that they give seems to suggest that it, it's true of all the rounds. So each round, it takes 308 million years to get to this point, And then another 308 million years to get back here. So one round actually takes 616,896,000 years. Now we're in the fourth, halfway through it. So that means we've, we've gone around three complete times and half of another, roughly. So that's why this chain is said to be 1.9 billion years old of the 4.3 that's allotted to it. Apparently, we're about 2 billion years into the manifestation the life cycle of life here on earth since moving over from the moon. Now I've been talking about these rounds and these life waves. This illustrates it a little bit more. It's just showing you that the life wave of all seven kingdoms, not just one, all seven. And as you see them over here, human, human, animal, vegetable, mineral. Um, and then it talks about these subtle elemental lower level kingdoms. So these consist of the seven. It, they, they come in from the moon chain and they go around seven times. And as we just said, we're in the fourth round. So we've been around three complete times, which, which was the basis for the 1.8 billion years. And we're halfway through the fourth down here on the physical globe, which is about another 300 million. So that's why we're at like supposedly 1.92 billion. So again, a kingdom takes an entire chain to evolve. The, not the rounds, the chain. You come into this, this chain and you go around seven times in, as in whatever kingdom you, you, you started. And, and so if you, were in the, if you were in the mineral in the previous, then you would evolve to the vegetable in this one. And it would take you seven rounds to evolve into the, into the animal. Or I guess through these elemental up into here. But let's just stick with the vegetable, animal, human thing. So it takes, uh, it takes the entire chain. So if you start in the scheme as a, at the lowest kingdom, you can, you can evolve out of the human by the end of it. Now, as you can see, 
throughout each of these, as each of these, as it progresses through the seven chains of the scheme, one kingdom is always evolving out and, and going on to the higher way into some other, the, the higher way, right? The sixth initiation. And another one has to come in to take its place. So that's why it's said that there's 13 kingdoms that pass incarnate through a, through a scheme or thir 13 groups of lives that enter a scheme and pass it through it. Because when one exits at the end of a chain, another one comes in to take its place for the next chain. So some group of lives ready to incarnate in the mineral kingdom, let's say, can enter in the second chain in the scheme because some chain from some group, some kingdom of lives evolved out in the first, in the first chain. And supposedly we, us humans here now, were animal on the moon chain. And so now this is here, we individualized. And it takes, takes a long time to individualize apparently, um, depending on where you got to on the moon chain, you would come in earlier or later on the earth chain, right? And this is the basis for some of the things we see here on this planet now where there's groups of people that are you know, vastly different grades of evolution. It could just be some are slower and others are faster, but there's also definitely different groups that, that come in later in, in the round um, or later in the, in, the, in the chain, the conditions are right for them to continue their evolution. So this is what this chart is showing. It just shows the life wave goes around seven times. And it's just showing you here that if you, if you entered the scheme in the human kingdom in the first chain, then you would basically be out, evolved out in the second chain. So in, in that chain, in the second chain, the animals move up to the humans, the vegetables move up to the animal and all these kingdoms. And then another one comes in from elsewhere to take the place of the lowest one. That's because the highest one's cleared off. And seeing it. So that's, that was the basis for the 13. One, two, three, four, five, six. Started and continued through. And then seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 carried on, came in from the outside in order to help it continue with others, with the various ones going off. So is that all clear? Does anyone have any questions or is anyone cross -eyed? I think Marion passed out. <laughs> No, I'm still here. I'm still here, definitely. I'm watching. Uh, so is everyone get, getting this? Is this clear? This is another way to look at it. The, the goal of the seven chains of the Earth scheme, apparently in the first chain, the highest initiation that was possible to, to achievable by the humans, or the goal, the goal. Some, obviously, some, some did exceed it, and some didn't reach it. The, the goal set for the first chain was the first initiation. The goal set for the third, for the second chain was the third initiation. And the goal set for our goal for the second was the third. The goal for the fourth was, was the R hat. The third chain was the R hat. And the goal for the fourth chain, the one we're on, is the fifth initiation. So if you're still here and incarnating here, it's because it's deemed that you have a chance of achieving the fifth initiation before the great judgment day, or not before, but in the, in the period of time of the entire chain, right? So by the end of the seventh round, you, it's possible that, you, that, that the people who are still incarnating here, now people at our stage who've gotten to the point where we are, where we're treading the path consciously, it's pretty clear that we're gonna make it. How far beyond that you're gonna go is another question but or whether you'll stay here and go off on the higher way unless perhaps unless you have like a really bad speed bump and crash and burn <laughs> you're probably going to make it but all the all the beings incarnating here on earth right now in the human kingdom it is regarded at this moment in time that it's still possible for them to achieve the goal for the chain which is the fifth initiation there will be, when we'll get to that in a minute, the judgment day, there will be something in the fifth round, a full round away, there will be a judgment day. And the, those who, it, the logos deems 
cannot achieve the goal will be taken out of the scheme, the entire scheme, and held over in Prolia till a scheme is available where some other scheme needs someone, a, a group of lives at their stage to incarnate in the human stage, and then they can continue their evolution there. So th this is what you're referring to about the judgment days. Yeah, we'll get to the math in a minute. There is a, something referred to as the inner round. The, the way to understand that is that is, as the life wave moves around the, the globes in the rounds, this is, this is the earth chain now, figured example, as it moves around them, each time it goes seven times around this right seven rounds in the earth chain um there are always some that are moving slower and can't keep up so they remain on the globe as sort of a nucleus of 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 lies to to form the basis when the round comes back around so that it can it can pick up where it, it can it can kind of wrap it can more quickly resume on that globe, the Manu and the lives, they move in and they use the existing ones there as sort of a basis for rapid evolution. They just rapidly evolve the, the units that are there. Now, what that means in the subtle globes, I don't understand uh, because we're used to thinking in terms of physical bodies and animals and minerals and vegetables, but there is these correspondences on the subtle planes and on every one of the globes in, in the subtle bodies. It applies on this globe as well, the, all the life forms that are here now, the, the, when the life wave left this globe in the, at the end of the, in, in the middle of the last third round, um, there was some group of lives that remained here on the planet. Uh, so that was roughly 900, well, roughly 600 million years ago, pr previous to it. And that those, those formed the nucleus of the lives that are the, the kingdoms that are here now. And then the Manu moved in on it. The Manu, remember what Manu means is be, Manu, uh, Manvantara means between Manus. That's a side note I have to, to get into. Um, well, I think I cover it later. But anyway, so the, the Manu moves in on, on, on onto the globe. Basically, the Logos is another name for Manu because a Logos is a type of Manu. Basically, what one finds is that all the Logi are forms of Manu. There's, there's round Manu. Round Manus, chain Manus, root race Manus, globe Manus, scheme Manus. So as the life wave goes around, round and round these globes, each time there's some group again that, that they couldn't keep up. So they, they stay there and they form the nucleus when the life wave comes back around and then the, the, new, the forms that they provide get rapidly moved into and evolved and according to the needs of the, the life wave as it's passing back through. And um, the inner round is referring to, specifically it refers to a group of lives that got in this round, that got left behind last time. They're at the human stage. They want to catch up. And they, through commitment to service and so forth, they can apparently get a special dispensation, quote unquote, from the Lord of the world. And then they move to the inner round. So then their next incarnation takes place because we're here on D, globe D, the, 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 earth, the earth globe, the physical globe of the earth that we're incarnating on right now on the physical plane. They move to the Mercury globe. To the Mer they, they incarnate on the Mercury level, which is the subtle realms. And then they, they basically try to move around and catch up. They rejoin us as we move around. If not, if they don't make it, then they, judgment day, they get taken out. So the inner round reverse specifically to those groups that want to accelerate and go around faster than the main body and catch up. This, this finally explains something that I never understood in the book Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda, where his master, if you remember, if you've, if you've read that book, Sri Yukteswar, decided that he that he was going to go, well, what was said was that he was going to go to Mars to where there was a groups of egos that were more conducive and suitable for his type of training, which was some kind of very sixth ray, severe, hardcore kind of a, kind of a pet training. And I, I can never understand what that meant. Um, I think the VGM at one point said, well, it's something to do with the inner rounds. 
it's not the physical planet Mars. And now it makes sense um, because this is called the Mars globe. So what it appears that Sri Yukteswar did is he's a master. He must, maybe he's on the path of earth service and that involves staying here and working with the logos on earth. And he went to assist the egos, the, the slower units, human units that are evolving slower than the, the group that are still back here on the Mars, the Mars globe so they can catch up and make the grade. So I think that's what it meant. That makes more sense to me now than, than that he went to the planet Mars <laughs> beyond the ring past not, which is another thing that's never quite made sense to me. Will it be possible for humans to get into a spaceship and actually go to one of these? Because there are statements in the secret document that say, no man can pass beyond the, the, the aura of the planetary logos. I guess we'll find out someday. So uh, I just put some of this stuff here, right? So the laggards that are left behind on each globe, they form the nucleus of a life wave. And then the in around refers to monads that fall behind. And um, with, if they have that strong aspiration, they can get this special dispensation and they can try to run around and catch up with us here. So this was showing it that they, they fell behind on this globe and they could get a dispensation and race around and try to catch up with the group on the on its next round and move into a slower class of monads so what as we see right now you've got to realize that even even right now in this fourth round right there are clearly groups of egos that are in vastly different stages right we still have some incarnating in aboriginal bodies and others incarnating in more atlantean type conditions uh, more primitive, let's say the American Native Indians or the, so all these, all this stuff, not, I'm not saying it's a basis for discrimination, but, but all these new age types that think that the, these Aborigine types are so much more quote unquote advanced spiritually than we are, they're just way off. <clears throat> they don't understand this whole concept of the, the evolution. Those, 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 those groups of human monads are way behind the curve. They're here because apparently it's regarded that they have a chance to, by the end of the of the chain, to achieve the goal. But if they don't, they'll they'll be removed in the fifth round. Being primitive isn't what so bad much what gets you in trouble, really. What really gets you in trouble is in on particularly on, on this chain is extreme individualization of selfishness and the egocentric concrete mindedness. Right, the type, the skeptic type that's skeptical of everything and constantly arguing and skeptical of 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 all these esoteric subjective things and lie or lying and deceitful. All those things will those will get you chucked out a lot a lot quicker than just being a slowpoke. So if they're still here, it's apparently because they are regarded as having a chance. But the cataclysms. And we'll get into that. They swipe you out. They just wipe you off the, the, the planet when, when, when the Manu decides that, that that group of bodies over there are just, are basically holding up the process and they're effectively retards and they need to be eliminated. Literally, the, where they're living is destroyed. <laughs> or if it's really massive, there's a pole shift. And there are cycles for all this. And the pole shifts and the continental reformation, it's all cyclical and under law, believe it or not and happens on a regular cycle, which they don't, won't divulge because they don't want people using it. All right. So this is, this was just focusing on the judgment day. This is, again, there, there are different, different levels of judgment day. Um, what the, the first form of it occurred in this chain in the middle of the round, in the middle of the fourth round, when uh, the door between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom was closed. So at that point, it was deemed that all the, the lives that had come from the moon chain and had been in at the animal stage in the moon, in the moon chain, there were no significant numbers anymore that it was regarded as could achieve the human condition and could achieve the objective. They were just the ones that were left that were still in the animal kingdom and potentially had, could potentially incarnate as human. Not were just too retarded to be able to make the to to, make, to, to individualize. So they weren't going to achieve the goal. 
So the door was shut. And so no more animal men were admitted to the human kingdom and didn't individualize. Now in the fifth round, which as I say is uh, because we're, we're in the fourth round and we're halfway through it. So we're 300 million years into it. There's another 300 million years to get to the end of the fourth round, plus another 300 million years to get to, to the point, to the middle of the fifth round, right? 600, 600 million years from now. That's, that's when any of the human monads that it's, it's not deemed can achieve the objective of the chain will be taken off. And so there's 60 billion human monads. And this is only talking about the human kingdom or the lives, the line of lives that pass through the human kingdom, not the Deva kingdom, which are also monads and which go through the elemental thing, right? The, the monadic, the human monadic kingdom or that line of evolution is the forms are the lives that form the, that, that use the forms. Whereas the Deva kingdom that line of lives, and none of this seems to apply to that so much. It's not really discussed. We're only talking about the human line, the line that goes through mineral, animal, human, Manu, Lord of a world, planetary logos, so logos, and so on. They, those are the lives that incarnate in, in the forms that are built by the Deva kingdoms. That's a different line of evolution. So the, of the 60 billion human monad, it's estimated that three-fifths will achieve the goal and two-fifths will not. So at the end of the fifth round, in the middle of the fifth round at the judgment day, apparently which will be a great battle on the mental, on the cosmic, on the mental plane, the two-fifths will, will be taken out. That's approximately, right, if there's 60 billion, then, you know, there's five times 12 is 60. So 24 billion human monads will, will be taken out of the, out of the scheme, and put into Pralaya and will, incarnate in the human condition in some other scheme. It's not said what that scheme will be or when or where or anything like that. It's just, they just taken off. And three fifths, 36 billion will, will, will continue on in this, into the scheme onto the fifth globe in the, in the rest of the remaining rounds in this, in this chain. And then um, on to the, to the, to the, to the fifth chain and the sixth chain and the seventh chain. Now, maybe there, there are, possibly other judgment days not much is said about it the the secret doctrine types hypothesize all this stuff dk doesn't talk about it hp doesn't talk about it i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna cover it so what does he say about that i, I just put a little note in here that's discussed on tree, trees of cosmic fire pages 390 to 392 and dk does say some stuff about it he says that um that'll be when sana kamara at that point in time, it's when he will attain the initiation, which is his current goal. So really, that's what it's all about. It's him attaining the initiation that's his current goal. When the human units that can't sort of keep up and, and do their part that, and to, to help him achieve his goal, then they leave. And at that point, everything really stepped up. And... Um, it's not why it's not helpful for the retards to, to remain around. So it, it's when he goes on and then he says things like the earth at that point in time, the earth scheme, the Mars scheme and the Mercury scheme will form some kind of a triangle of relationship. And these are the schemes, not the globes in this, in this scheme, the actual planetary schemes, those three will form some kind of triangle of relationship that, that will be important in this solar system. It just says it's one of the secrets and not much can be said about it, just that it'll, it'll happen. And, again, and also, all this stuff that we're talking about, this only covers the condition of the solar system during our chain. But he does, he does say that this is just, a lot of this stuff is, is specific to uh, this time. He also says that a new group of human monads will come into incarnation in the Earth scheme at that judgment time who I guess are achieved, they'll come in from this to the scheme, right? From outside the scheme, from somewhere else. Apparently they are, they'll be closer to whatever the, the group level is in our fifth round. And it'll be a use, it'll be a suitable time for them to come in and to continue their evolution when we're at that stage. 
So you really begin to see the, the, the massive scheme of this and how lives are moving and circulating all around. And so then he goes on to say that the uh, Judgment Day in the fifth round, will make the world war. He said it'll seem like, you know, nothing. And that the battle will be on the mental plane. And it essentially will be a battle between higher and lower mind, um, a battleground for the causal body in a certain sense. So some of this battle that we're seeing for the minds of men right now, the, the whole thing that has to do with cosmic evil, where it's distorting truth and spiritual realities, that's all related to it, right? It's all, essentially, it's all fostering concrete mindedness and materialistic materialism and material mindedness versus wisdom. And the whole thing is about the, the fusing of booty and manas and the transmutation of, of lower mind into higher mind. And that the battle will between will then will be between egos and egoic groups and that they'll seek to the retards or the ones the holding things up are, are essentially concrete minded types that that prefer materialistic kinds in, in imprisonment basically and this is his words not mine imprisonment the life of the spirit right he says they're unable to free themselves from matter and prefer captivity to the life of spirit and, and they're related to the lords of the dark face. So it's all that evil. Um, they are the lords of the dark face. And it's all tied back to the moon chain and the concrete mindedness and the materialism and the, the gross egocentrism and um, the really evil selfishness. And all this, he says, is related to the fact that the earth should be in its fifth round right now. We should be a full round ahead. And paralleling venus although venus is in its fifth chain but they're in their in their fifth round as well so and so we should be in our fifth round paralleling it and that it's this delay was due to the the same creeps that are here now being a problem that he refers to as the lords of the dark face on the moon and you'll you'll i'm gonna give you some quotes that are really like mind-blowing and it makes one the more i read this stuff the more i realize that things like uh the lord of the rings is it's kind of like a documentary <laughs> and one has to consider that tolstoy probably read this stuff i think i already was a theosophist and he, and he did read it and he must have read some of these stories out of the a.e powell and some of the stuff that he gets into into what was going on in the moon chain and some of the stuff that Ledbetter and these people wrote and some of the black magic that was going on in Atlantis. And um, he must have got into all that. So basically what it what causes you to, to make the grade is that you basically have to be devoted, dedicate yourself to the path, which is serving the plan and helping humanity. So, you know, I, well, one wonders if these, these really hardcore skeptical types that, that just try to browbeat everybody into submission with their yeah. uh, concrete mindedness, denial of all kinds of anything esoteric, anything spiritual. And those are the types that are in danger. <laughs> so um, just a little bit about Manu's. There's a motto of a scheme, which AKA planetary logos. There's a motto of a chain, a motto of a round, a motto of a globe, a motto of a root race. In a certain sense, they're all emanations of the same one that then incarnate in some entity gets overshadowed, some lesser being. And then Manvantara, it means period between the Manus. And it can, therefore, it can be applied on many levels. Now that's the basis for being in a lot, for the difficulty one finds in the books of, doesn't it, well, wait, well, over here he said that a Manvantara is this, and over there he said that a Manvantara is over that. And, and over here he says a Manvantara is this other period of time. That's because it depends on, yeah, you have to be, you have to realize what this means. It means period between Manus. Um, and you have to know, well, what is he talking about? And then and you'll know which, which type of Manu he's talking about. So if he's talking about a root race Manu, that's one thing if he's talking about. And some of these Manus have the same name because in a certain sense, under the doctrine of emanations, they're sort of regarded as, as an aspect of the same being operating in a different scale. <clears throat> And in a different uh, level. And uh, that's where it gets difficult. And they use those terms as veils. So sometimes in the TS books, when they talk about, 
they're talking about the earth chain and they say, and at the end of, at the end of this period, 4.3 billion years, it'll be a new solar system. That's because, well, it won't. What it'll be is it'll be a new chain and the chain will be incarnating on different levels. So it'll see the sun differently. But it's it, from the perspective of the solar logos, which is nowhere near the 311 trillion years, God knows where we are exactly in that. But we're somewhere in the middle of all that. And uh, um, clearly that isn't going to be ending and starting. Um, it's just a veil that they use, a hiding term to, to prevent people from knowing the exact cycles and what applies to what. Because there is danger in, in, in understanding these things. Because if you understand these things and the way they all work, you can actually use it to work out stuff in terms of cycles within your own life and use it selfishly. And they don't want that. So in cosmic fire, DK refers to the period between a globe and a chain as a day of Brahma. Powell in his book defines it as a period of one chain. So that's, I was just using that as an example to show you just some of the veils and how it's a bit, a bit hard to sort it out. DK says a Maha Manvantara is a great, which means great Manvantara is a period between chains. And that's one year of Brahma. 100 years of Brahma, the period of an incarnation of the solar system. And then it gets down specifically to our chain, our earth chain only, our fourth chain in our earth scheme. As I was saying, it's 1.95 uh, billion years into it because we're only about halfway through it. And this, the whole period is a day of Brahma, which is the 4.3 billion years of the earth chain. We'll have a Manvantara, a pralaya, right? A night of Brahma of 4.3 billion years before the earth scheme moves into its fifth chain. Now they refer, one of the other tricks is they refer to the Manvantara as, as it's basically half a chain. And this is, this is important because this is where we get into the difficulty of figuring out, well, like, and as, and don't forget that in the rounds, things are slowly descending and getting denser. And so this is where we get into trouble. So we're about in the bottom halfway through the, the fourth round and we're th roughly 300 million, 308 million years into it. We've got another 308 million years to go before the end of this round. The full round is 616 million years. There's seven rounds. So that's where, you know, seven times six is 42. That's where you come up with this roughly plus all the little in, 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 in between bits. That's where you come up with the 4.3 billion years. So Basically, it says that it's been about 300 million years from the beginning of the fourth round. And it took all that time to develop the astral prototypes of everything on the, on the previous globes to land down on this fourth globe and to get to the Earth thing, to, to where we are now. The, some of the dinosaurs and things that we find, those are from the previous round the third round, right? The, the, and, but they were, they were, they were on, in the subtle plane because that round was a little less dense. And mm -hmm. so as everything gets denser and so descends onto the concrete physical plane, the etheric form that those lies left behind from that round densifies along with it. And we find, we find its image in the rock and, and, as, and call it a fossil and think it actually walked on the physical plane. It didn't, it was on a subtle plane. It's analogous to like a leaf leaving an impression on the rock. It, but so, Cliff, what about so, the bones that they have found? The, the, what about the bones they've well, found that they're, they're, they're 97 million years there old? Are some, there, are some, there are some dinosaurs that lived within the period of time of humanity's existence here on this, in this round, there are. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the ones that are said to be 600 million years old and 400, you know, way back, even even earlier, they're not. They're from the previous round. So it's in, in this is sort of a good point to, to stop anyway, because now we're going to get into the evolution of the Rue races and go back over this because there are no hard and fast lines in the beginning of one root race and the end of another. Like these are some charts that I did where the first root race, it started, it wasn't physical, it was called the Polarian, because it apparently it, it existed in 
the region of the North Pole, when the North Pole was basically where the equator is now, and therefore was always facing the sun. And so the earth was sort of like half was always in sun and half was always in darkness. And this race lived in the land of eternal sun. That's where some of these myths come from. But out of every, uh, the next sub race, the next root race always comes out of the, the sub race of the previous one. So the second comes out of the second sub race of the first. The third root race comes out of the third sub race. But there's a tremendous amount of overlap in the years where they coexist. We have Atlantean types still here on Earth. In China, the Manu of the fourth root race still incarnates here on Earth. The third doesn't. The fourth root race is not regarded as reaching its height yet. So it isn't done. There are, and it provides a suitable evolutionary ground for wherever it is. Right now, the core of it is in China, where the Manu is. But for its evolution, for all those types in the scheme, in the, in the, in the chain, that are not ready to move into the fifth. Um, and so there's a whole lot of overlap. So when, when we just go back into here and we start talking about these period of time, like 300 million years to get to the point where we are, well, really more like 308 or so, there were the, these races. The first one started there, but and it's not given how long that one has lasted. These periods are also very secret, very esoteric. They don't give out any hard numbers in books. Um, all we know are the numbers that DK gave us, which was at some time in the middle of the third root race, uh, the animal, animal man, the human kingdom, which was still in its animal condition and in process of evolving into the human, individualized somewhere in the middle there between 21 million and 18 million years ago, right? The process of individualization started 21 million years ago and really accelerated when Sana Kamara came here from the Venus scheme. And we'll get into why that is, why he came from there 18.6 million years ago. The Venus scheme is where you eventually go, apparently, if you're, if you're on the path of becoming a planetary logos. You will, you, if, you, if you make the decision to tread the path of planetary logos after you, at, in your sixth initiation, you will eventually go to the Venus scheme to train. And so perhaps he came back here to help. And there's also, a, there's also some kind of a connection between the two, right? Venus is our alter ego. And uh, the Lord from Venus came to Earth to help us catch back up to where we should be in our fifth scheme, even though we're in the fourth, in our fifth round, even though we're in the fourth. So there's all these fives that are coming into play. I will do a, a, a brief overview. So last night, yesterday, in the Maitreya Sangha uh, study group, we started this overview of rounds and globes and chains. And I'm going to rapidly go through some of the bits and pieces of it, just so that you remember, to get to the point where we kind of left off. We were talking about... Um, the fact that space is an entity and it's the being within, within which we live and move and have our being and that a solar system. Uh, and that's according, not according to me, it's according to the stanzas of Zian uh, and Blavatsky. It, solar systems start as basically giant comets as do planets. And that the logos that is about to incarnate finds some nebula of gas and then somehow manages, becomes a comet and navigates back to the relative region where they're of space, where their previous incarnation was. And then proceeds to form um, a disc and somehow get the disc divide into rings that become planets. And a lot of this material is in the secret doctrine. And this book is the solar, the solar system by A.E. Powell is very good overview, although it has a lot of errors that HPB tried to correct, but they ignored, and DK subsequently corrected as well. And then this book um, is also good for summaries. He, he's, he's more concise and to the point, and he summarizes some basic points, and it's actually helpful to figure out some of the confusing elements in here. 
And so we basically started with a solar system and I was just showing everybody that basically what a solar system is and how, how, how it's interconnected to all of the, basically the, that it, it is a center in the one about whom Noah may be said. And the reason he's called that is because he's so far beyond anything that even a master can, can understand that the master can't say much about it. And then we were showing the, the relative sort of levels of, of beings within beings, a cosmic logos, a solar logos, a heavenly man, a man, and, and how it all breaks down. And we were showing that the one about whom not may be said is related that our solar system, which is a center, the heart center, supposedly, in the one about whom not may be said, is related to all these other things, the 12 signs of the constellation and all these stars and each of these, these constellations are apparently karmically related. And they're not just arbitrary pictures in the sky that some astrologers decided to invent. They're caught clairvoyantly viewed to be interrelated um, and to be karmically related. And I have to say, I understand what that is because when I was 26, I was shown this um, in my mind. And I saw a map of how everything related. I just wish I could have remembered it and written it down. <laughs> but I remember roughly what I saw and all of these things are interrelated. They're actually, they're all karmically related. Um, so then from in Cosmic Fire, DK shows us this whole concept of the planetary schemes. So just as a reminder, a scheme is a planetary logos and a planetary logos incarnates through a scheme. And that scheme goes through a cycle of seven chains and each of those seven chains goes through seven rounds of seven globes. And, um, and uh, uh, well, actually we were looking here and we just, we were kind of realizing that the earth is considered to be the fourth chain in the fourth globe and Jupiter is the third chain in the fourth globe. And so we covered all that. And then this chart sort of shows you what that means in, this is a, a summary of the earth scheme. And these are all the chains in the scheme. And they, they're given names in the Powell book. The names are a little different. I'm going to go with DK's names. DK's names are the ones that I stuck here in blue. Um, he does say that the, the convention of naming these schemes and also the globes after planets is confusing and should be stopped and uh, should probably use some kind of just a plain numbering system. So every, every chain has goes through its life cycle. The logos, all the lives that the logos is is working with incarnating this chain and then it goes into a kind of like a pralaya um and uh, or a, a rest period a night time and then it goes into the next chain and it goes around it seven times and then it goes into a rest period and we get to the moon chain which was the chain previous to the one that we're in and which actually the physical moon that we see out in the night sky is the dead remnant of that chain um and that after that period of death the logos went into a pralaya and then went out into the to the area beyond the edge of the solar system and picked up some cometary material and became a comet and found his way back into the solar system and basically arrived next to his previous incarnation roughly well, it's not really clear when, but the, the, the cycles of things seem to suggest that may have happened close to 2, point, uh, two, two billion years ago. Um, and that it managed to, to pull off all the matter from the moon chain and started pulling it off into the earth chain, into the earth body and the moon rapidly shrunk. And what we see now is, is a much smaller version of what it was. And we acquired a lot of that matter and the whole, all the life on that chain moved over to this chain. The other thing you need to understand is that 
that each chain gets progressively lower in matter. So the first chain is on the Atma, Bodhi, Manas, and lower Manas planes. It has basically consider these things as bodies or vehicles like your astral body, your mental body, your uh, your various your various bodies. And it, with each each chain, it moves lower down down into dense matter. And when it gets to the fourth, the one we're in, there's a dense physical globe that is visible to human eyes. And then we looked at this close-up map of the the Earth scheme. This is this is from Cosmic Fire, and uh, we compared all the other planets that we that we know of dk says there's many others that we don't that are in different stages of their their life cycles that aren't aren't visible and um another thing to keep in mind is that well so this this is this is now we're talking about the earth chain right we're talking about this chain the fourth and these are the seven globes of the chain and the life wave goes around these. So it enter, when it enters the chain, the life wave, it's called, and the life wave consists of all the seven kingdoms of monadic lives. They go around the chain seven times, successively passing through the bodies. Now, I don't know if I made this clear the other night, but it's analogous to the bodies are more like this, right? So you don't want to think of them really as these separate things kind of out here in a circle. You have to really think of them more like your own vehicle. So you have a physical body, an etheric body, uh, an astral body, a mental body, and they're in consec consecutive, consecutive rings. And so at night, when you go to sleep, your consciousness is no longer focused in the physical body and it's active in the astral body. So in that way, you can sort of understand what it, what it is like to go from these globes. So the consciousness of the Logos is focused in one or another of these vehicles. And he's in, in the earth chain, he's now descending down through his vehicles. Um, and in, in each, each life wave starts in the earth chain, it, it starts uh, here on the lower mental goes to the astral, goes to the physical, etheric portion of the physical, then the dense. So, so the, the focus of the logos, it's consciousness and his most of his activity is in this vehicle, right? So that's really what it means. It, he has other vehicles, his other, his other bodies, his, his emotional and his lower monastic and his monastic, and those things do have activity, um, but it's not the main activity. In the same way that you have an astral body, but when your consciousness is focused in your physical body, that's kind of where it's all focused. It doesn't mean there are things going on in your astral body that, that impinge your consciousness to some extent. They're, they're not as, as significant as, let's say, the amount of time and the way it works when you're asleep at night. They, you know, just a reminder, these, these life waves go around. We're down here on this fourth one here, this, this D globe, this earth globe. We're in the fourth, the fourth round, the, right? The middle of it. And just a reminder that um, it takes an entire chain seven times around the chain, the globes in the chain for a kingdom to evolve into the next, to the next kingdom. So in the moon chain, most of us probably were animal and it's on this chain that we've individualized into human and on the next one will be in the superhuman realms unless we sufficiently evolve to the point where we can take one of the, the the higher way on the sixth initiation and pass out of the scheme good luck unless you take the path of our service then you can do like what Sri Yukteswar does and go to one of these other globes and help out this chart was just showing the objective for each of the chains, right? And how in our fourth chain, the objective is the fifth initiation. So at some point, humans, and it seems to be often focused on humanity, um, the objective in the first chain was the first initiation, in the second chain, it was the third initiation, in the fourth chain, it was, in the third chain, it was the fourth initiation, and in the fourth chain, our chain, the earth chain it's the fifth initiation so at some it's deemed that some people humans in the human kingdom 
at some point in the seven rounds of this chain, we'll take the fifth initiation and pass out of the scheme. That's the overall goal. There's this concept of judgment days. And basically, DK says that two thirds, two fifths, sorry, will not make the grade. And it's expected two fifths of the 60 billion human monads will not make the grade. Um, and that that judgment day will happen in the middle of the fifth round. So we were discussing some of the time sequences associated with that. So that's, we're in roughly the middle of the fourth round. The middle of the fifth round is 600 bil uh, million years away. And so in 600 million years, if you don't measure up, um, you're going to basically be taken into pralaya and you'll get a chance to continue in some other scheme. And what measuring up means is if, if it looks like you can't achieve the fifth initiation in the remainder of the rounds up to that point, then those monadic units will be taken out. And they anticipate that two fifths or 24 uh, billion of the 60 billion human monads won't make it. And the other 36 billion will. And at that judgment day, uh, there'll be a new group of egos who are roughly equivalent to the group that's remaining at the time of the fifth round who will be able to come in. I guess they didn't make it in some previous chain, some, in some other scheme somewhere. He doesn't say what, but they will come in and, and fill in the gap. So this is roughly where we got to. Uh, and we were talking about time periods in these schemes and, and also this concept of manus. And it's very important to, if you start to study this, you have to understand that in this material, they use a lot of veils. So for starters, the, the word manvantara means between the manus. Now, why is that relevant? Because a manu is in control of everything, really. There's a, a chain manu, a root manu, a globe manu, a race manu, the, 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 the scheme manu and the chain manu could be regarded as the logos. And there's a globe manu that presides over the entire seven rounds of, or the, or the round on that globe. There's a, there's a round manu. So there's all these different manus that, that exist for different periods of time. And they use these things as veils. And so you kind of need to understand the context in which you're talking about in order to understand the time frame, but one of the one thing that's fairly certain, HPB said it uh, pretty clearly, and Peruka sort of explains it, is that the start of the Earth chain occurred 1.95 billion years ago, and that that's roughly half because we're in the middle, and um, HPB also talks about how a Manvantara, and this is where it gets a little weird. Um, is 308 billion years. Now the confusion is that's only half the round. And that's because they're apparently, they talk about the 14 Manus of the chain. And it seems like there's a Manu for the, for the first half and a Manu for the second half. And so since there's seven rounds, then there's two times seven is 14. So the, the period of time for the full round is 600 and roughly 616 million years, which means that all seven rounds take approximately 4.3 billion years. So Earth's been around, or the, the Earth, the Earth, this Earth globe that we're on has been here for about 1.9 billion years, almost 2 billion years. And it'll be here for another 2 billion years before it starts to go into obscuration uh, at the end of this particular chain and the end of the seven rounds of this chain. And then it goes into Pralaya for another 4.3 billion years. Now we are in the middle of the fourth round. And now we're only talking about the fourth round at this point and the, the 300 million years since the fourth round started, right? I'm talking about here, it's gone around four times or actually that one's better, right? That one. It's gone around four times, and now we're here in the fourth round. And um, it's taken 300 million of those roughly 308 million years where we are for the astral prototypes of the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdom 
which were left over from the previous round to be upgraded, so to speak, through inc rapid incarnation and rapid evolution to be usable, the life wave that's incarnating in on this globe in this round now. So it has to, it, it's constantly evolving, but it uses the remnants of the previous round of the seven kingdoms that are left on the previous round as the nucleus for where it starts. And this is where we get into this difficult thing where the ages and the, of the geological ages and dinosaurs and things like that, according to HPB, they don't really, they, don't, they, they, they existed in more subtle etheric substance in the previous round because with each round things get denser and in the fourth it's the densest kind of descending down through the planes onto the concrete physical. And we're at the bottom, basically. Fourth chain, fourth round is sort of like the bottom of the bottom. It's, it's, it's the densest of the dense. Uh, now it's starting to, and so it was getting less dense this whole period of time. And a lot of the fossils that we find that are old, really old, they, they might be from the previous round. And the they, they sort of crystallize in the rock substance as it's getting harder and densifying from the etheric onto the concrete physical, kind of like the way a leaf leaves an impression on a rock. It's almost like a photocopy, which is why they wouldn't find any genetic matter in anything that's that old. Uh, they might find genetic matter in stuff that was from this round that, um, that's crystallized, but not anything from the previous round. Oh, and then the other thing was that it was in the middle of this round that Bhavasvatu Manu incarnated, brought, you know, in the mid, in, in, during the period of individualization of animal man, 18 million years ago, he came to earth. So the thing to realize is that in every round, there are seven root races. So we're, we're only going to talk about the fourth round right now. So in the fourth round, there are seven root races. And the first, we are in the fifth. We individualized in Lemuria or, or animal men who came over from the moon chain. And there's different, different levels of different grades of evolution uh, coming over from the moon chain, right? We've been here 308 million years, roughly. It took uh, um, the, the first, well, let's see, we'll go here to look at it. I, I did these rough, these rough things. So the dates on these things are not given very clearly. It's considered one of the secrets and they don't publish it. So from the beginning of the round, not really clear, but it could have been 300 million years ago. The first root race was evolving. Now it wasn't dense physical. It was very subtle, etheric. It, it, it apparently lived in the Northern, in the, the North Pole region of the planet. And the pole at that point was where the equator is and the pole always pointed towards the sun. So, so it was like the land of eternal sun. And that's where all of those kinds of myths come from about that. The next race always comes from the sub race that's numerically related to it. So the second root race comes from the second sub race or the first root race. Maybe it's estimated from 79, 27 million years. Now there's a lot of overlap between these root races, even though the nucleus of the next race comes out of the previous race, it takes a long time. This, the, the first race in this case, or any race, still has a long way to go to continue its evolution. And the, uh, the, the next race, that nucleus takes a while to evolve before it sort of achieves its high point. And so there's a tremendous amount of overlap and you can't think of them as sequential. We still have a Manu of the fourth root race here now, we don't have the Manu of the third root race, he's gone, but the Manu of the fourth root race is still present on earth or a Manu of the fourth root race, not the original. And he lives in China apparently. And um, he presides over that fourth root race, which still has a, a quite a while to go. It's, and there are the consciousnesses on the planet that, that for which that is suitable. We still have remnants of of Lemurian and early Atlantean in the forms of the Tasmanian Aborigines and the Australian Aborigines and all the Aboriginal types who, who are, I guess, the, the retards basically of the race in a certain sense. Um, 
sorry, that's not PC, but it's esoterically correct. Um, who, who are still incarnating in those conditions and for whom it would be a tremendous advance to move into a more fourth root race type of body. Um, if a monad is still incarnating here on earth in some capacity, it's deemed that up, up until the judgment day in the middle of the fifth round, they have a, they apparently can potentially achieve the goal at some point. Not maybe this round, but numerous rounds later. So this was just a little math that I was fiddling around with to kind of like to figure out how many, how many rounds, globes, races we've had in each chain. So by the time of the earth chain, you're, you've had, there's been 25, uh, we, we're, we're in the 25th round. We're in the 172nd globe. We're in a 1202nd race because there's one on each chain and the rounds of globes and all that. Um, and where the 80, the fifth root race right now is the sub race. What that we're in is the 8,412th and the branch race is 5882. In case anybody cares about that. In case you were wondering. Just in case you've lost your identity completely. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but the important thing is that it really it starts to get important here in Lemuria. Now, Lemuria started ages ago, and some of the things that are described about it are just like ridiculous. Um, we'll, 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 we'll read a few of them, but I mean, we're talking things that are half man, half animal, scaly. They have three eyes. They have all kinds of weird shaped heads. Um, it, they're, it, you, the more you read, the more you realize that the Lord of the Rings is actually a documentary and, um, and that, uh, there's more truth that I wouldn't be surprised if Tolkien read some of this, um, stuff from Powell because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there. That's exactly like what happens in the movie. Uh, it is that it's that bizarre. So, the, the humanity individualized in the middle of the third round 18 million years ago, but the, the process of individualization took a long time. It wasn't overnight. It took millions of years. It wasn't, it wasn't simply that the Lord of the world came here and zap, we individualized. It, it started 21 million years ago. And um, then by 18 million, 18.6 million years ago, when, when Sana Kamara came to the earth, the process was well underway and that, that radically accelerated it. That isn't the normal process apparently, but the earth was, because of the failure on the moon chain, the earth was a full round behind. We were expected, we were supposed to be in the fifth round and at this point, but there was some kind of an error and some kind of a problem due to very material, materialistic and crystallized individualized beings who became the lords of the dark face on the moon chain and basically the lord the, the logos stepped in and aborted so now they are trying to accelerate it here and with the assistance of sana kamara and the lords from venus who came in from the venus scheme to assist us what determines all of these things? It is astrologically determined, all these cycles, actually. And if you know what to look for, you can, you can actually predict some of these things. The, apparently, the, some of the, the, the main basis for it is, are these two, these, these two cycles I've occasionally talked about, the rotation of the apsis points. So these are the apsis points. So these, these things rotate in a 112,000-year cycle. Although that cycle actually oscillates. It's not always 112,000. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more over long periods of time. And that the, then there's also the procession of the equinoxes, which is the other thing we know where this goes this way over a 26,000-year cycle. And it's sort of interesting that branch races are roughly one um, sidereal cycle of 26,000 years. So there's something about that that governs a branch race. And the combination of these two things creates a, 
a cycle that's of roughly 21 to 23,000 years. That also oscillates, but that has a lot to do with the weather. And with every processional cycle, the tropics recede from the poles, it said, basically, which means that the, the angle of the Earth's inclination changes with every 26,000 year cycle. And that after a certain amount of those, there's a pole shift. And we're coming up for one in two more degrees or, and I've worked it out, it's amazing. It'll be eight signs from now when the equinox point when we're in an age of cancer, which is interesting because that's where it all started. So it wouldn't be, would not be surprised if a lot of these things are keyed into the cancer where it all started, the whole process of individualization. So there will be a pole shift in about 16 and a half, 17,000 years that basically wipes out the, the sub race of the, the fifth sub race and clears the decks for the, for the sixth sub race of the fifth root race. The, all these racial cycles involve changes in the globe. Now, these maps were apparently clairvoyantly given by one of the teachers to some of the early TS types. And uh, Elliot wrote this book on Atlantis. Um, it's a very interesting book. I have it. And it includes all these maps in it. And it shows what the world looked like during the various periods. Lemuria looked kind of like this. It's in these red bits. This was also above ground, these blue bits. This was the, an earlier thing that had more to do with the early root races in the, in the northern pole regions. But by the time of Lemuria, the third root race, it, it was in these brown areas. And you can see the, in the white area what, what, what our continents look like. They weren't above ground, though. They were all under the ocean. then. So this is Lemuria at its height. Right. And you'll see it's a lot of it's over in the Pacific and in Southern Asia and included Australia and South Africa and maybe parts of the polar region. Um, I'm not sure what that is. It's it's interesting that they don't really mention too much about Antarctica. The thing that's not clear is I think stuff moves and with all these pole shifts and other things, they, they moved. Then there were some cataclysms. And it, it ended up looking like this. And uh, this starts to be closer to the, the time of the Easter Island time. And you'll see that over here is roughly where the Easter Island stuff is all in this region. And so that brings us to, to the to the third rate root race. And I uh, just reminding that there's these overlapping periods and that it's not clear when they started. In the middle of the third root race, there was a pole shift that destroyed the remnant, anything that was remaining of the second root race. And it also caused a, a massive climate change. And so in the third root race, this is talk it gets really weird. So even at the third root race, which starts to be the first physical thing that we would call physical, the first sub race of the third root race, the Lemurian, were the, called the sweatborn, right? So they, they didn't procreate through um, sex. They were, they were hermaphrodite and they somehow, that's why I say it gets really weird, they oozed something out of themselves that became another Lemuria. And then by the time that the second sub race, they began to, and they weren't, they were still not hard bone. They were soft bones. So you, we wouldn't find any skeletons of them because they didn't have hard skeletal remains. By the second sub race, their bodies began to harden. Um, they, their bones were still soft and they couldn't stand up and they gave some kind of birth through something egg-like, but it was a soft egg. So maybe kind of like the fish egg type of thing. By the third sub race, they were regarded as, they started to, to, to give birth through eggs, but they were still hermaphrodite and they had both sex organs. At, in the man and the woman of today, you know, the man has gonads and those, those are sort of the, the ovaries that have become, the, basically both sexes have both organs actually. They're just, the form is a little different. 
And but in this time, they 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 didn't. They were more reptilian like in the sense that they if you take an, a reptile and leave it on a desert island, it, it can lay an egg, even if it was a male. It can suddenly to, to continue on. So the bodies were getting harder. Uh, it, it said it was to be similar to chicken-like in the sense that the chickens apparently have dual sex organs. And they were giant, gigantic. They had three eyes, the third eye, which is what turned into our pineal gland eventually. And their language was monosyllabic, which of which Chinese is the only kind of, is the closest remnant, although obviously much evolved since then, because this was a long time ago, right? We're in the third subway, so individualization hadn't really happened there yet. By the time of the fourth subways, they're still egg-borne. Now they're basically laying eggs. The sex was starting to, to appear as, they were starting to have be either male or female predominantly. And as the process of individualization happens, right? And we all know that concrete mind is, is, is dualistic and that individualization takes place on the plane of mind. And it's that process that, that initially causes the dualism. And so that, that dualistic mind is reflected in the dual sex. And so we, this is where we start to have the separation of the sexes, but apparently it took five to 6 million years to evolve. Now, this is completely contrary to anything that science says. The only thing they'll agree with is that we seem to go through a lot of these stages of all the various kingdoms in the womb. You start out as a single cell amoeba, amoeba and you go through all these different things like a tadpole and you go, you go through all of these different conditions as if we'd done it before. Um, but at any rate, the separation took five to six, 15, five to six million years. And apparently it began roughly 15 million years ago. And it, was, it wasn't completed until 10 to 11 million years ago. So it's in this fourth subrace when they were becoming uh, separated sexes that they began to build the Cyclopean ruins. And there were monads that hadn't incarnated in the earlier root races because they were further along on, from the moon chain. And so they waited until this period to come in. And that's one thing that you will realize is that there are monads of different grades. So for instance, many of us who are at this point on the path now, we're a monad of, of a, a much different category than monads that are still incarnating on you know, uh, Australian Aboriginal bodies or even in, out in, in the kind of common folk of out in the countryside who are, who are still early stage Atlantean in their consciousness. Um, and that is suggests that we might have been in, in the slowpoke group in an earlier chain, um, but sufficiently ahead of the bulk group. So that by the time we get to this chain, we're the lead group. You see that kind of thing happens where people leapfrog. This is where we start to get into all this weird stuff about pithecoid and anthropoid apes. So the distinction between the pithecoid apes and the anthropoid apes is that the anthropoid apes are like the chimp and the gorilla, which are the things that look kind of more man-like. And the anthropoid apes, um, sorry, the pit and the pithecoid apes, the pithecoid apes are the, like the things like the baboon and the lemur and these things that are more monkey-like that are, they don't really look like little men or min or primitive men. They look like they're, they're, they're more of an ape type species. So it's in this period apparently that men were that the early humans were pithecoid ape like and that as the race evolved the, some some group of, of of these things were 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 sort of devolved to what we have now and that various animal souls that, that weren't able to individualize used them and took them by the time you get to the fourth root race, there were still pretty, very primitive, mindless types who weren't that much more evolved than these things and basically procreated with them, which is, was, which is referred to as the sin of the mindless. It's that procreation that produced the anthropoid apes, the chimps and the other things. And what we have today are the remnants of those.
So by the time the fifth and sixth so races, they got more man like and they regard they were said to have eggheads and blue skin. I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know if it's like the blue skin like you see on some certain baboons or what. Uh, it's it's not clear. The eggheads you you apparently they 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 persisted for a long time and and came back in South America and they do find these egg headed type skulls seems to have been some group that you can look them up right now. The UFO community is trying to figure out if they're aliens, <laughs> but DK calls them and HBB refer to them as the eggheads. So they're not aliens. They're early there. There's some, some kind of reemergence of some recessive gene that, that popped up, within relatively recent time. So um, the seventh sub race, by that point, that was the thing that, that, that looked closest to us. And uh, the only, re their remnants are what we now find in Atlanta, Australia and Tasmanian, various other tribal cultures, that seventh sub race, and, but also mixed to some extent with fourth root race. And uh, that's these guys. This is what we looked like. And this is the size we were. This is, Lemo the, this is what the seventh sub race of Lemuria looked like. On Easter Island was, was one of the remnants of it. And apparently it was destroyed in, in one of the cataclysms when that race was basically being cleared out 4.5 million years ago. And then it, this little piece of it popped up. And they're said to be life size. And we, we were 27 feet high and we look like this and you can see these little relative things. Um, and obviously they're very old because they look how much dirt and strata they're buried under. So, um, you know, just to get back there, this is from this, my, one of these books that I was reading, the tribal Bigfoot thing. And this was, these, these illustrations were done by, uh, the state forensic artist of Oklahoma. He's the head forensic artist. He was engaged by the author of these books who has been chronicling kind of Bigfoot sightings and things like that. And obviously the guy is very good at, he, they show him what, what, what he's able to do just from a description and how close it looks to a person. And he was engaged to talk to eyewitnesses uh, of for all the Bigfoots that they see. And the reason I included here is because these are some of those, those early animal man types that, that are still running around in the woods in various parts of the world that are still in the animal stage. Now, I don't know if these will be some of the ones that will come in when the door is opened or if they'll have to stay on the planet until the next chain or what, but you can see that they're, they're sort of, um, there's, they're not animal. They're semi-human. They're, this is the anthropoid ape thing. They, they might be, they might be, uh, some of the, the product of the sin of the mindless. Now, interestingly enough, what I find is that the Indian tribes have a tradition of occasion while well, they steal their women, but occasionally Indian women would choose these things as mates because they were good providers in terms of big and able to hunt and blah, blah, blah. But there we still have the sin of the mindless undergoing. And it's why the Indian tribes don't talk about it too much because there's this ancient taint of the sin of the mindless because the Indian tribes are basically Atlantean and Atlantean in their consciousness. And they have some memory of, of, of this whole thing. And it's still going on to this day, strangely enough. And I just thought it was interesting. This was a, a newspaper article. It was in the back of that book, Tribal Bigfoot, that, that talked where the Indians announced after on Vancouver Island, a bunch of Indi uh, Bigfoot attacked and killed some people. This was in 1924. The Indians said, look, in their tradition that these things are during the process of evolution. This is their words. When the Indian war uh, was changing from animal to man, this Siatic tribe, which is what they call the Bigfoot up there, did not fully absorb the soul power and thus became an anomaly in the proceed of evil. That is literally what they say. Basically, what they say is these are 
animal man that did not individualize. So uh, another thing I thought was interesting was this is an artist rendition of some of the early Tasmanian uh, Aborigines. And look at the ears. They still got this weird big ear. And this is from Angora Watt. And look at these things, dinosaur. HPB says they were contemporary, early. Angora Watt is said to be much, much older than modern archeology span would accredit it. And look at that little relief. How do they know about that? They have, it's in their books. It's in, it's in all the Vedic and Eastern texts. So all these wars of battles and all this stuff, it's in there. So anyway, I just include these. Uh, there's just the fact that we were much bigger. This book, a book I uh, one, one that I read and collected, it's just got hundreds and well, actually more like thousands of reports from all the newspaper records around the United States over the centuries. All the same things that HPB re referred to. These guys went into the book, into the old newspaper archives, and dug all these articles up reporting all these farmers in the 1800s, in the seven, late 1700s, digging around and digging up giant bones, which mysteriously all disappear. You can see a documentary on this uh, about to this day in Sardinia and Corsica and Malta, farmers find these things. And when they find them, people from the church show up and take them. Mm -hmm. To this day, I saw a documentary a couple of years ago about that people talking about how it was going on let's say in the last seven years they're still hiding and suppressing this stuff anyway these ancient kind of maltese and ruins on those mediterranean islands these are remnants of the uh early earlier races and the constructions that they built so then we get to the fourth root race in the middle sanar kamara began to to, to plan it um, and his arrival, it took a million years to, to prepare the race. It started with the, sub, the, th the fourth sub race or the third route race. And it took a million years to get to the point where it was ready to be used. And, with, and they do this through breeding, if what um, Powell says is, is correct. And I, I don't have any reason to believe that it's not. That basically the Manu incarnates and or has his disciples incarnate and as kings or uh, and leaders and they move the groups of people they they isolate a, a particular group that they regard as being the nucleus of something that they want to see evolve and they move it someplace where it can be more isolated and they 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 it takes ages of moving groups of people around thousands and millions of years to get the race based on what their plan is. But that's how they ultimately do it by moving people to different parts of the world, protecting them from the cataclysms, basically doing a form of breeding, sending representatives to other areas of the world to intermarry and then come back to, to, to bring in some new bloodline that they want or some strain. And it's, it's literally a form of bloodline. So, the first subrace was what they call the Ramols that appeared about four to five million years ago, and it was 10 to 12 feet tall. They call it the Powell says the best rem example of it is for Foo's man. That's for Foo's man. The second subrace was similar to what we would call Cro Magnon. That's Cro Magnon. Looks fairly modern. Seen, seen guys like this walking around in Europe. <laughs> looks looks kind of Swedish to me. Third sub race, the Toltec. Now, not, not the Toltecs we know, although the Toltecs we know are we know in Latin America are remnants of it. They they were one of the, the, the strongest, longest ruling. These guys eventually became the black magicians that, that precipitated the, the destruction of Atlantis. The four subrace 
were called the Turanians, and they were from about 800,000 to 200,000 years ago. Violent, warlike. Chaldea was a relic. Uh, they had an astrological religion. The fifth subrace flourished. This is oh, Atlantis. Flourished 800,000 to 200,000 years ago, also in some other area. So it said to begin in areas around Scotland and Ireland. It spread south and west, going to India. And then out of that stock came our fifth root race. The uh, sixth sub race with the Akkadians, they also emerged uh, in, in the 800,000 year ago time frame, went off to a different part of the world, eventually settled in Sardinia and Acadia. They found it Stonehenge 100,000 years ago, apparently. So it's said to be Stonehenge is apparently 100,000 years old. And it was built by a group of Atlant fairly advanced Atlanteans. And they used a crude style as a form of protest to protest the very luxurious and extravagant style of Atlantis at that point. Because 100,000 years ago, Atlantis was building everything in gold and covered in marble and all these like ornate things. And it was very materialistic. And um, people were, would, hire, would hire priests to pray to the likenesses of their statues and all kinds of stuff. So this group of... Acadians went off into the northern regions and built Stonehenge in a primitive style to, 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 as a protest, apparently. And then out of the seventh sub race, the Mongolians emerged. And that apparently, that's where the, the Manu of the fourth root race is centered now. And it has not yet reached its, its zenith. So these maps also given by the teachers in this Elliott book on Atlantis. Uh, this shows Atlantis in its prime up to about 800,000 years ago. And 800,000 years ago, because of the black magi magic of the Turanians, the, the Lord of the world destroyed it. And there was a pole shift. Just a couple of pictures to show you this. This footprint is somewhere in South Africa, I believe. I think it's legit. Uh, that's how big we were. One of our large early Lemurian types stepped in some kind of mud and turned into sandstone. This They call this a uh, genetic deformity, deformity. I don't think it is. I think it's an appearance of a recessive gene. All these faces look sort of similar. They have a similar structure. I think you're looking at what we looked like a couple of hundred, a couple of million years ago when we were 12 feet tall. After the cataclysm of 800,000 years ago, you have, that was the pole shift. Then this is what Atlantis looked like. And it was like this for another 200,000 years, up to about 200,000 years. And there was land here, land here, Europe, parts of Europe were in the water, parts of Africa were under the ocean. Um, 400,000 years ago, there was a school of initiation established in Egypt. 210,000 years ago, they built the pyramids. So the pyramids are 210,000 years old, two of them. And those were to house as repositories, talismans and various things, which for the cataclysm that they knew was going to happen 200,000 years ago. So this was 210,000 years ago, they built them. And then 10,000 years later, there was another cataclysm. And that, that cataclysm caused the world to look like that. And there was a lot of flooding in here and a big ocean and Egypt was submerged temporarily. And so this is what the world looked like from 200,000 to 80,000 years ago. And these are the islands of Ruta and Daitya, which are some of the Indian Books discuss the Vedas, the Puranas, uh, mention these islands. These were Atlantean islands. About 100,000 years ago, there was a battle uh, between black and white magicians. It's, it's described on page 233. Um, there's one, one thing I wanted to read, just, just like to show you just how weird it got. This is right out of the Powell's book, page 233, Solar System. About 100,000 years ago, 
the white emperor in the great city, being Mars being one of his generals, Heracles, the wife of Mars. This is when they were like finding themselves all through time and you know, blah, naming themselves Mars and Corona and all these things. The great rebellion was plotted, headed by Odwarpa, a man of strange and evil knowledge, a lord of the dark face, leagued with the kingdom of Pan, semi-human, semi-animal, right? It's apparently real. Creatures who are the originals of the Greek satires, Odwarpa gathered round himself as emperor of the midnight sun, a huge army. He established a worship with himself as the central idol, which was sensual, riotous, and held men by animal gratification. Against the white cave of initiation in the city of the Golden Gates was set up the dark cave of the mysteries of Pan, the earth god in caverns deep in the earth. Odwarpa, crafty and ambitious, was at the head of the federation of the outlying kingdoms, which arrayed itself against the white emperor. By his compact with the denizens of the netherworld, he had abnormally extended his own life and had materialized a metallic coating around his body, which rendered him impervious to spears or sword thrusts. Alcyone, by instinct, shrinking from the black practices and their orgies, was beguiled into taking some part in it by the allurements of a maiden. Cygnus, a wild and drunken revel, ensued. Out of the earth emerged a wild procession of hairy bipeds, long-armed and claw-footed with animal heads and manes, non-human yet horribly human. These gave the revelers drink and ointments, which made them drop drugged and senseless on the ground. From the huddled heaps there sprang animal forms, astral materializations, fierce and conscienceless as animals, cruel and crafty as men, which passed into the outer world full of lust, snarling and ravening, returning into the human forms again when their orgy was over. By means of these rites, Odwarpa obtained firm hold over the people and great, gained great power over all, power also over the subhuman kingdom. He himself had a bodyguard of his magic animals, desire forms materialized into physical bodies, and these he would lose at his, at his enemy, loose at his enemies in battle. They fought with teeth and claws, spread panic among the startled hosts, engorged on the bodies of the slain. The decisive battle was fought against the white forces at the city of the Golden Gates. Heracles captured and torn to pieces by the horrible animals. Odwarpa became emperor of the city of the Golden Gates, but not for long. Vavasvata Manu came against him with a great army, destroyed the artificially crafted pan animals, scattered Odwarpa's army, and slew Odwarpa himself. It goes on like that. And I'm just... I just read that to just show you just like how weird it, 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 it was. I mean, it's the Lord of the Rings. That's why I say Lord of the Rings is almost like a documentary. Anyway, um, so this is from the book on Dweller on Two Planets. It was dictated to, to someone in Mount Shasta area by a master that apparently lives there around that area. There's a lot of rumors of masters around Mount Shasta in Northern California. And these, these are some of the pictures to, from the scenes. And this is showing you what now I worked out in that book. That book is from some things, some comments they made about various astrological things. That book is, is roughly after the, before Poseidonus and after the set, this, this destruction that was precipitated as a result of the, this battle. So this was in the period between 75,000 years ago and 10,000 BC. And Atlantis had these, these sort of monorail kind of electric things. And they had machinery and they had radio and TV, apparently. This is what the world looked like up until that, that battle. And then it looked like this, with which Poseidon is being the island that the, and the rest of the world starting to look a lot like what we recognize it to look like. Um, this was after the Manu destroyed all that black magic stuff. And so the, in that period, in, after that destruction and before the destruction of Poseidonus, they, they had these Vimana things and these 
monorail things and ships and things like that that went work used the real force and other types of forces that they, they understood from their clairvoyance and that the initiates gave them. And it was a relatively modern civilization, apparently. I included this just to show you just how old this is. This is John Anthony West. He wrote the book, The, the, the Serpent in the Sky. This is Dr. Robert Shark. He's, he's a geologist that basically came and upset the apple cart for all the anthropologists by stating that on the basis of geology, the Sphinx and the pyramids have to be incredibly old due to the water damage that, that, that he sees taking place in the area around the Sphinx. If you know how to read this thing, you'll, this is the, the, the Zodiac of Dendera. You'll see that there's three positions of Virgo showing that this, this particular Zodiac illustrates, and, and the, you'll see this is Leo and this is a Leo. And so there's a couple of different versions of the Zodiac in, in concentric rings. And um, this one has the tail pointing down and this one has the tail pointing up, basically implying that the positions of Leo at, when relative to the pole star an entire half cycle away um, of 15, of uh, 13,000 years or something like that. And, but the three positions of, of Virgo that they show in, in this thing means that they, they observed three positions of Virgo, which takes it back to, to the, the, to the 78,000 year dis destruction. So this, this thing was showing their astrological recordings after, from the period of time that, that they moved back to Egypt after the destruction of, of, of seven, you know, 75,000 years ago or whatever. They moved back there and they, had, they have re astrological records going back that far. Now we, we're basically at the end of it. Um, and we come to the fifth root race, our, our root race. It's said that the mind who started preparing it a million years ago. Um, and so there was a, you know, a lot of overlap between the fourth and the fifth. And there's still a lot of overlap between the fourth and the fifth. And the Hindus were the first sub race, the Egyptians are the second, the Arabs slash Semites are the third, the Celtics are the fourth, Teutonics are the, the, the fifth, which is basically what we are and um or variants of it and that uh, the sixth sub race will emerge out of what's what's the six it'll actually emerge out of the sixth branch roots race of the fifth sub race and which is what's happening now in 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 basically the united states and new zealand and australia and canada and and to a certain extent starting to take place in Latin America where there's all these different cultures mixing and blending. It's starting to become a, a worldwide phenomenon. So the last thing to, to understand is that the, the yogas apply to each of the root races and they relate to the, because in the final analysis, the, the root races have to do with the evolution of consciousness. So with that whole scheme in mind of just how vast it is, it's all about the evolution of consciousness. So the yoga for the third root race was Hatha yoga because they were becoming the first truly human race and they had to literally learn how to control their bodies. So the soul needed to learn how to take possession of the body. And so the yoga for them was Hatha yoga where they learned to consciously control the physical body and that brought them to the portal of the first initiation. Then in Atlantis, the, the first, there was two yogas. The first is Laya yoga. And that was basically to help them basically coordinate and train and, and use the, the, the chakra system, the etheric centers, and to stabilize the etheric body and develop the astral body and psychic nature. And then they it was augmented with bhakti yoga, which, which further developed the, and purify the, the astral body and the personality into a, into a kind of a devotional form of mysticism. And that's the basis of 
the sort of a yogic incentive that we first think use when we, we enter onto the path and we're still sort of in Atlantean kind of a consciousness. So in the highest initiation available during the fourth root race was the Arhat initiation, which brings us to the, to the end of this thing, which is here we are in the fifth root race, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, written down 11,000 years ago from the oral teachings of that have been used for the last million years. And that the, it's the fifth yoga for the Western type of consciousness. And we're in all the fives, fifth root race, fifth sub race, fifth principle of Manasa mind, fifth plane of mind, the fifth initiation. So everything about this root race is a five and particularly our sub race. And, the, and this is from my other talk that I did, which I've just been editing the video for. And I, I was just overviewing what the four bucks are, the problem of union, the steps to union, union, chi, the illumination. And that the whole process is really to train the mind what to, to register what the soul knows and achieve illumination and to enable the, the initiate basically to gain control of mind, right? So first initiation has really a lot to do with taking possession of the physical body. The second has a lot to do with the soul taking control of the astral body. And the third initiation has a lot to do with the soul taking control of the mental body and perfecting the entire personality. And so that's it. That was my overview of the rounds and globes and chains. So we started out in space in the cosmos and here we are down here on earth in the fifth root race and the fifth sub race doing our little Raja yoga. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Incredible. Yeah, very good. Amazing. What a journey.